Okay, I want to be very, very precise with the framing of this video. I'm not titling this Why New Jedi Suck or Why New Star Wars Bad. Even though I do agree with those sentiments, no, my aim here is what Jedi used to be. In other words, I want to tackle this question of what makes Jedi so compelling, so iconic, pretending that only episodes four to six exist. And let me explain why. This is something I've thought about a lot. I noticed that there's this weird thing that happens methodologically whenever people try to find what makes old Star Wars good by looking at what makes new Star Wars bad. Analogy, let's say you're trying to learn how to make the perfect cupcake. So you take a great cupcake and you compare it to a really awful one. And the awful one is just someone dumped vinegar in it, just like a lot of vinegar. So now if you try to compare, the first thing you're going to notice is all the vinegar. You will be mind blown that someone would be this stupid to dump a whole bottle of vinegar into cupcake batter. You will not be able to stop talking about how stupid the vinegar cupcake people are. And you will have learned nothing about how to make a great cupcake. That's how I see a lot of Star Wars discourse online. There's just too much that is loudly wrong with new Star Wars media. And analyzing that can can definitely be informative. There is a lot to learn there if you're meticulous, if you're thorough, but so much of it just ends up being about why you should never put vinegar in your cupcakes. As if that's some big principle of cupcake making, it's not. So when I say what Jedi used to be, that's what I want to look at here. Pretend new Star Wars doesn't exist, and actually pretend old Star Wars doesn't exist either. Pretend you have zero idea of Jedi, and this is the first time you're being exposed to any of the Star Wars universe, and let's build a slow, careful understanding of how Star Wars is doing the magical warrior faction trope, which is what Jedi are, but in a way that is just so so much more compelling and iconic than any other sci-fi or fantasy story has ever done it before or since. And we'll start with our first scenes introducing our first Jedi, Obi-Wan Kenobi. The first Obi-Wan scene is him chasing away the sand people and saving Luke. And this scene, this whole sequence, is weirder than it seems, especially in the context of what we're really introducing here. Because this seems like just old man, fine, dumb boy, uh-oh, I help. And plot-wise, this is the legendary bombad general our space prince's sister is seeking to enlist to overthrow the Galactic Empire. Think about what you would expect an introduction of that character to look like. And now think about this scene. Here's my friend Noam describing his read on what's being shown to us here. If we're looking at the coolest thing that I can show you as somebody watching cinema, mm -hmm. as the coolest thing that you would like to be, like if we go for a moment with the hypothesis that you're watching movies or listening to stories in order to consider what you want to become, then mm -hmm. the Jedi, which is here not very different from just any other old wizard, is somebody right. who right. is capable of conflict while still being sweet and, and smart, like you're in a society that really focuses on your intellect, but you, mm -hmm. you're afraid of conflict. And the wizard is there, and he's doing something clever in that kind of scary situation. First of all, he's capable, but the way mm -hmm. he does it is like, hey... Oh, cute little droid. I'm here. He's not like a brute. So what does that say? The fact that we kind of go all the way out into this like kind of wild place and then we find this person who is like, seems like you're saying in a lot of ways the opposite, but also a specific type of opposite. The opposite of what? Like, seems like we get the story starts with kind of the setting, which is boring. And then we, we also have kind of like a wildness that is, is added when, once we get to like this specific area, right? So like the moisture farm and everything is like super boring. You know, he finds R2 and then it's like he's fighting the sand people and everything is like kind of going nuts and then we encounter this person that you're saying is like gentle and who is in control so it's, yeah it's not just boring it's boring and it's restrictive and it is unkind and unempathetic unkind. <laughs> and ben kenobi is like hey are you okay it seems like you've had a rough day like the first thing he does is be nice to the droid and be nice yeah. to yeah. uh luke himself Ha. Huh. The first thing we see a Jedi do is not use the Force, it's not have a big epic lightsaber fight, it's to be kind to someone, and to be capable and calm in a scary environment. Unless you say, oh, this is kind of just a throwaway scene, this is just how the characters meet, they need it some way, but the real first scene is the lightsaber scene, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, etc. That's the important stuff. And to that I say, nah, -uh, incorrect. Although you are correct that this isn't actually technically the first Obi-Wan scene. The real first Obi-Wan scene is lunch at the Lars farm. Even though there's no actual Obi-Wan presence here, this is the first scene where he comes up. Listen to this. Oh, I stumbled across a recording while I was cleaning him. He says he belongs to someone called Obi-Wan Kenobi. I thought he might have meant old Ben. Oh, I wonder if he's related to Ben. That wizard's just a crazy old man. Uncle Owen is a mean little bitch. Let's face it. He has this hollow, grumpy affect constantly. He's incredibly dismissive of just about everything about Luke. I mean, listen to this. He died about the same time as your father. He knew my father? I told you to forget it. 
Your only concern is to prepare those new droids for tomorrow. You can waste time with your friends when your chores are done. He's just nasty. It's like a second language to me. I'm a yeah, All right, him. shut up. I'll take this one. In fact, if you think about that first little moment of Obi-Wan Kindness, and you hold that in your head, and you go back through the entire movie leading up to that, every single scene is depicting chaos, i.e. the opposite of calm, or characters being really mean and contentious to each other, the opposite of kind. You got Vader choking random people out. You got Leia snapping back at him, justifiably. Jabba's are kidnapping droids and selling them like slaves. You got C-3PO kicking poor R2, and then we have this tough family situation. It's not torturous, this isn't the Dursleys, but it is cold and uncaring. And then obviously all this is in the middle of blaster shootouts and 3PO having panic attacks and general moisture farm stress and sand people being mean to us. So this is to say we can tell Obi-Wan's calm and kindness is important because we spend like a half hour building up the contrast, building up its opposite, chaotic hostility. And we're doing that so that the calm and kindness will feel more noticeable, more potent when we finally do get this little drop of empathy and peace from Obi-Wan, and so that the only thing that we'll associate those traits with in this story is Jedi. So that framing makes me think that this calm kindness thing is pretty important. So what's that about? Why choose this as the thing to make Jedi about, and really to make the whole first part of Star Wars about, instead of like lightsabers, the common sense empowerment thing? So to take a step back here, we gotta examine the trope. The sci-fi warrior faction, or the fantasy wizard faction, however you want to term it, what is it doing? What functionality is it providing its stories? And I think Noam framed his comment beautifully with the answer to this, this is a trope of adventure fiction. And adventure fiction is aspirational. It's about becoming the hero, often the legendary hero, often the most legendary of legendary heroes with the big destiny and chosen one and save the world. And that sounds great. If I can do it, I think I can. Wait, hold on one second. It's really me? You really want me to become, are, are you sure you got the right guy? That's how we feel. We do aspire to this role, but we're also intimidated by it. It feels too distant. It feels impossible for someone like us. So here's how this trope works. With a faction, I don't have to become a hero. I can become just one of these guys. And that feels way more attainable because then it's not the legendary chosen one, which is intimidating. I don't know if I can be that. But no, with a faction, it's like, oh, there are a lot of people like that. I don't have to be King Arthur. I can be a knight of the round table, one of many. The numbers alone demonstrate how attainable the identity is and also how adaptable it is. I don't have to be this specifically, I can be my version of the role. So basically attainability is what I'm identifying as the essence of the warrior faction trope. In order to embark on the hero's journey, in order to walk that road, we need to develop a self-image and an image of heroism that's malleable enough and welcoming enough that I feel like I could be that. The hero could be me. Hello there. There's a reason why that Obi-Wan line became so iconic. This is literally the hero's journey welcoming us. This is what Obi-Wan is designed to be on so many levels. The primary symbol of attainable heroism in this movie is actually, well, it's not Obi-Wan. It's Anakin Skywalker, or at least the vague Anakin that exists in Luke's mind for the first two movies until the big reveal. That is the hero who could be me. That's the hero I will naturally grow into. But since dad isn't here right now, we have Obi-Wan who knew dad, who was friends with dad, who fought alongside dad, and is there to tell us, you are going to become this. I knew your father, and I know you, and I see that same potential hero in you. It's very casual, but that's what this whole conversation is really about. He was the best star pilot in the galaxy. I understand you've become quite a good pilot yourself. You are like him, and that means that I can invite you to walk the same road. In that vein, something that still blows my mind is the placement of the first lightsaber scene. It's easy to see magical sword and just assume Excalibur, Anduril, Masamune, big legendary sword with grand history that will do the epic hero once we prove ourselves epically worthy. And that's just not what's happening at all. There is no earning. There's not even any epicking. It's not built up to even in the scene. Obi-Wan just gives it to us and then that's it. We basically don't use it until the second movie. So why introduce the magical sword like this? It's because Star Wars wanted to frame this as being more about connecting with our dad. It's about seeing ourselves as easily capable of following in his footsteps. It's not that big of a deal. It's something we can do. And just to be precise here, this is not about the empowerment itself being easy. The gaining of skills, the using of skills, that's not what this is about. This is about making it easy to see myself mentally in that role. And of course, while we're talking about lightsabers, we gotta talk about the classic line. An elegant weapon for the more civilized age. The lightsaber scene is also guiding us to build a very particular image of what Jedi are. Think about the way Noam said it, following this path, becoming empowered in this world, will not transform us into a brute. Instead, we'll be kind, we'll be at peace. Basically, we can still be normal. We can be a regular person. Because Obi-Wan isn't some big fancy knight living in a big fancy castle. He's not an enlightened being living in some spires and toga city in the sky. He's not a rugged wanderer, mercenary bounty hunter. He is a normal guy. He even has a normal name. 
Ben, I know a Ben. At least I think it's what, I don't know, it's what Facebook tells me, I don't know. But anyway, Star Wars is saying to achieve princess saving levels of heroism in the story, it's not gonna make you sacrifice your identity or your ability to relate to people or your decency or your sanity. This is a type of empowerment which won't change you into something you don't wanna be. You can still be you, just a more capable, kinder, more at peace version of normal you. So we have this faction trope as our key to feeling attainability for this hero's journey. And then Star Wars has built all this emotional scaffolding around it to make it even more more attainable through our father, through Obi-Wan's personality, through how he treats us, through how we see him living his own life, through everything he's not, through how easily he empowers us. But the problem that all these magical factions need to overcome at some point, and this is a real problem, is the fact that magic isn't real. Sorry to break it to you. So I can make heroic magic stuff feel attainable in all these secondary ways, but then the jump from normal attainable person to wizard is just gonna feel like a big jump. That is where the story could easily lose us, except not with Jedi. And this is just pure genius. This is by far the most impressive world building thing about Star Wars to me ever. Star Wars has designed its magic system so precisely to avoid the exact obstacle we just described. Listen to Obi-Wan explaining what the Force is. Now the Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. Okay, now hold that description in your head and now think beyond that scene as well. Think about what you know about the force. Think about how you see it used, how the powers express themselves, all the different kinds of force powers. And now listen to this explanation from my analysis partner, Squirkle. But kind of speaking like on a more general sense with like the Jedi, I've always been kind of fascinated with the force is like a kind of like a, a magic concept because it's so vague like and it feels very intentionally vague about the things that it can do and the things that it is like it's the force like even the name the force is such like a broad random like physics term um but uh, to kind of add on to what kale said earlier where it's it's about the what they represent in the religion mindset over the actual like power to do things by setting it up that way it's very easy to feel like the force is real like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person who has, like, extended my hand towards the remote and been like, I'm, I'm force pulling the remote into my hand right now. Why is this not working? Um, but but it, it takes all of these experiences that we already have, like, the feeling of being in the zone, of being, like, in tune with the universe, the, like, emotional base with, like, light side, dark side, and those giving you, like, actual powers. Because that's what it does feel like in the moment. Like, you can do things when you're angry that you can't do when you're happy. Like, they're, they're very different. Um, and it just kind of takes all of these, like, experiences that we already have and then says they can give you superpowers. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Somebody just knocked on my... Seems like someone knocked on her door, I guess. But anyway, it's an incredible point that this big lofty thing that will make you a magical hero is something that's actually so close. It's so familiar. It's already inside of you because it's already inside of everyone. You've already felt it many, many times. Listen to my friend Joe's formulation of the idea. Like for example, if to um, go on that amazing journey, he, he had to learn how to be the best uh, football player or the best, even like sword fighter, uh, maybe me, you know, Joan, I would be like, yeah, okay, great for him, but I don't care. Like, I don't see myself in that person because I don't care about football. I don't care about sword mm -hmm. and whatever, you know, but it's not that. Like, the thing that he has to learn is is, is extremely, extremely universal because it's it's literally in everybody. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. what's everywhere. The force itself is designed in every way to feel attainable, but also somehow without sacrificing any of its momentousness, its aura of great importance. It is a great thing that I am capable of achieving. Okay, now there are two major, major topics about Obi-Wan that we have not addressed yet. And really no analysis of Obi-Wan or Jedi would be complete without discussing these things. The first is the iconic Obi-Wan death scene where this happens. You can't win, Darth. Strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. And number two is the culmination of all of his guidance, i.e., this. Use the force, Luke.
Both of these themes seem vitally important to what Jedi are, and it's kind of hard to see how they fit into this whole attainability theme we've been talking about so far. And that's because they don't, maybe. Nothing we've said so far explains anything about these two scenes, maybe. And that's because we've been doing kind of a weird thing methodologically so far, maybe. Everything we've been saying up until now was an audience side explanation for why Jedi are compelling. But the question remains, what is the story side reason for why Jedi are compelling? What is the powerful idea that Jedi lend to the story of Star Wars to make the story itself impact us more profoundly? And it does impact us profoundly. People find a lot of meaning in the story. And in the moments that have to do with the Force specifically using the Force, the idea of alignment with the Force, the paradigm of light side and dark side, this stuff strikes us as real in like this deep mythical sense. So what is that? Why do we look at that and say, yes, that is a true hero? And I think the time has finally come to talk about a certain little green friend. It's time to talk about Yoda, our second Jedi. If Obi-Wan is the Jedi who opens the door to start us on the Jedi path, it's Yoda who guides us down that path. He's the one who shows us what the Jedi path really is. So we're going to cut right to the chase here with the two biggest questions. With Yoda, there's also two big pivotal scenes that are also really truly difficult to understand. The first is also his big iconic moment, the big Yoda moment that he gets remembered for. It's this. And the questions are, it's very straightforward, if Luke could lift the rock, why couldn't he lift the plane? And if Yoda is so smart, why give his student a task that he cannot do? Or really more accurately, why did Yoda not just expect him to be able to lift the ship, but actually think he was doing it at first? Or even more accurately, why did Luke sort of succeed at lifting it at first and then fail? How does that work? What am I supposed to take away from that? And then overall question, what does this have to do with the Force and with becoming a Jedi at all? I thought the Force was about all these connections between life and the galaxy, not lifting rocks, like randomly moving things, specifically inanimate lifeless things. How is this Jedi training? Okay, now second scene is the one that is seemingly supposed to be confusing, which itself is kind of weird. Luke is just kind of randomly like, oh, and Yoda's like, yeah, cave. And then Luke goes into random cave. He fights a low frame rate Darth Vader. He kills him seemingly. And then he sees his own face underneath the Vader mask. So my question is, what the f is going on here. And yeah, I get that this is foreshadowing the I'm your father thing, obviously, but what does this have to do with anything up until now? And also, again, how is this Jedi training? It looks nothing like the rest of Jedi training, which by the way, we also still don't quite understand. And if anything, this seems to be kind of a test that Luke failed, maybe? Maybe it's some sign that he wasn't ready to quit his training, which is what he's about to do right after this. So maybe that's it. How is that it? How is it a test? Or what does it mean? What is it testing for? So really just what is this? It's confusing. It's weird. Don't like. Never liked. <laughs> the scene always may be super uncomfortable. But it needs to be explained. That's my job. All right. <sighs> okay, so anyway, these were the two big Yoda questions in my mind, these two scenes. And in searching for answers, I didn't find answers. Not immediately, but what I did notice, what was kind of inescapable for me to notice coming to this from Obi-Wan analysis, was this very strange pattern. It was the super specific structure of parallels between the two characters. So let me describe this to you. Obi-Wan is a hermit. We have to travel all the way out into this far off area to meet him. But then Yoda is a super hermit. And we got to go all the way to this far off solar system to meet him. We initially go off in search of Obi-Wan because of this weird random message that sends us to find him, and we initially go off in search of Yoda because of this even weirder, more random message that sends us to find him. When we meet Obi-Wan, he's not some bomb bad general, he's just a kind old man, meaning he breaks our expectations of what we expect to find in a Jedi Master. And then we meet Yoda, this little green kid who crawls around and plays with all of our toys. He breaks our expectations way, way further. Obi-Wan is an old guy, he's in his 50s, and Yoda is an even older guy. He is in his 900s. So what this pattern tells us is if we're set up to feel like Obi-Wan is Obi-Wan, then Yoda is gonna feel like the super duper Obi-Wan, which makes perfect sense until this happens. I cannot teach him. What? Huh? That wasn't the deal. Obi-Wans are, like as a species, supposed to want to train us. That's supposed to be how it works. So what is happening? And we start to realize, okay, actually this isn't Obi-Wan. This really is not Obi-Wan. It's true Obi-Wan broke our expectations of what empowerment looks like and then Yoda did that further, but the form that takes? If Obi-Wan equals Jedi, I can imagine myself becoming that. But if Yoda equals Jedi, I cannot imagine myself becoming that. Obi-Wan is standing on the sidelines of a life I don't really like. I 
I'm isolated. There are all these people around me who don't care about me. And he is welcoming me to embrace this ambitious side of myself that people around me hate so I can walk the epic heroic path. Compare that to Yoda who's standing far away, entire star systems away from life that I now actually really love. I'm surrounded by friends who do deeply care about me. And I have to leave that in order to go isolate myself with him on some swamp planet, only to be told that the ambitious side of myself that my new friends love, that Obi-Wan loved, is exactly what prevents me from walking the epic heroic path. You are reckless. With Obi-Wan, he gives us these tasks that are just out of our range, and then he guides us, and then we do it. And then Yoda gives us these tasks that we can't do, and we just straight up fail or we're left confused. Obi-Wan makes us feel like heroic empowerment is closer than we ever dreamed. Yoda makes us feel like heroic empowerment is distant, impossible even. You want the impossible. With Yoda, being a hero is something that feels far from us. It's 900 years away. We don't belong here. We'll never be this. And the evidence of how much we'll never be this is the fact that we do fail in becoming this. Luke fails in his training. He cannot do the Jedi stuff Yoda asks of him. He doesn't even really listen to Yoda at times. No weapons. You will not need them. And then big picture, he definitely doesn't listen to Yoda when it comes to completing his training, and as a result, he does fail in this movie. Which actually kind of helps us, it's a beautiful clue. This means that we can look at what Yoda was trying to teach him, we can look at decisions Luke didn't make, and maybe from that we can infer what the supposed grand, amazing, profound Jedi philosophy is. So in that way the failure might aid our analysis, but then also of course it does lead to more questions. It makes Yoda's teaching even more head-scratchy than it already is, because you're telling me, 900 years of teaching experience, and this guy doesn't realize when his student is not getting it. He doesn't realize when you need to change up your teaching strategy so that your student doesn't literally walk out of the classroom filled with unearned confidence and a total disregard for any of your cautions because he doesn't really trust you as an educator. And maybe that's because you failed to earn his trust by doing things like Oh, I don't know, lying to him? Whole thing is just weird. Yoda is weird. Okay, so answers. We gotta go on a little deductive journey here. I'm gonna ask you to follow me. This is gonna be fun because the story actually leaves us a very elegant breadcrumb trail straight to the answers if you're looking for it. And the first step is actually abundantly clear because we see the exact moment Yoda changes his mind about whether to train Luke. It's right here. He is too old. Yes, too old to begin the training. But I've learned so much. He finished what he begins. Luke has learned so much, that's something which gives Yoda pause, and then he wants to confirm with Obi-Wan that Luke will finish what he started, finish his training. So that's interesting. And if we're paying attention to that, we are conveniently automatically pointed right to the next breadcrumb. What was Yoda so freaking adamant about Luke finishing? And I want to point out that that's a very peculiar kind of educational goal. If I'm trying to teach someone, I don't know, soccer, let's say, I'm not going to say, well, if you don't become as good as like a FIFA player, I'm not going to teach you. I would never say that. That makes zero sense from an educational standpoint. On the contrary, to whatever degree you continue training and learning, you will be that good at soccer. And that's great. If, as an educator, you are so deeply concerned about your student finishing the education, then what it must be like is something similar to cooking, maybe. Like, let's say it's a recipe. And the final step is putting the cupcake in the oven. And if you run out of the kitchen to go save your friends before you hear that last step, then your cupcakes are going to be just wet batter with, like, raw eggs. Or maybe it's, I don't know, second to last step, I guess, frosting. Either way, what I'm saying is sometimes the steps of an educational curriculum are quantitative. The more you cover, the more educated you become, and sometimes the steps are qualitative. For example, you can cover all those prior steps and they don't matter unless you reach this one step which is transformative of the entire nature of what the education is doing. If Yoda is so concerned with the end of Luke's educational journey, if it doesn't matter how much he learns, if he doesn't finish the training, if Yoda is saying literally all is lost if you don't get to this one point educationally, what he's describing to us is a qualitative endpoint to his Jedi training curriculum. There is some lesson, some idea, some perspective shift that will come come last, and that will be transformative for all of what Luke has learned thus far. Okay, so now what is this big idea that Yoda is trying to teach Luke? And remember what we're looking for specifically here is a big transformative final step to Jedi training that Yoda thinks Luke is not going to get, but then after assurances from Obi-Wan, he tries to teach this to Luke, but Luke fails to learn this in episode 5, and because that he fails plot-wise in episode 5. And also, this lesson is something that Luke eventually does learn at some point in episode 6, because he does eventually complete his training, and because he did learn that idea that leads directly to his success plot-wise in episode 6. And, again, we already know exactly where to look. The address of those answers is those two pivotal but super perplexing Yoda scenes I mentioned earlier, Luke's two failures, his failure to lift the plane, and his failure with low frame rate Vader in the dream cave. So what's the big idea? Well, let's listen to what Yoda's saying in the scene. I can't. It's too big. Size matters not. Look at me. 
Just me by my size, do you? Actually, let's back it up a bit. Here's Yoda trying to teach Luke this lesson right before his failure. Master, moving stones around is one thing. This is totally different. No, no different. Only different in your mind. So what must you say? Luke thinks size does matter. And he thinks specifically that size, or maybe we can take a small step here and say physical differences, fundamentally change the nature of things. Lifting a rock is totally different from lifting a plane because rocks are different from planes. Sorry, ships. So who cares about rocks and ships? How is this Jedi training? Let's take another careful step here. We know that Yoda's big idea is not just about rocks and ships because the next scene is this. It's not just rocks and ships that are the same, it's also you and your father. What's the idea? What is this absolute biggest idea that wins the Star Wars and answers all of our Yoda questions and all of our leftover Obi-Wan questions as well? The idea is that through the Force, through ultimate connection, everything is the same. All differences are illusory. Yoda repeatedly tells Luke this. You must unlearn. What you have learned. In other words, you and practically everyone else live in a world defined by preconceived biases of difference. There is a fundamental difference between big and small, between this life form who's like me, who I can trust, and this life form who's weird and isn't like me and I'm suspicious of. Or this type of life form which I'm comfortable with versus these types of life forms which I am uncomfortable with, which I consider a nuisance and I feel threatened by. This is what power looks like. This isn't what power looks like. This is possible. This isn't possible. This is good. This is evil. This is like me. This isn't like me. Yoda knows that Luke's mission, the form his ultimate objective will take, is impossible. Turning Darth Vader to the light side, finding the good in this tyrant, this murderer, this betrayer and genocider of the Guardians of Peace and Justice in the Galaxy, killer of younglings, steeped in the dark side for the past 19 years and under the inconceivably powerful control of the most evil dark side master in the entire galaxy, Luke is going to make it his mission to turn that guy back to the light side? Impossible. End of story. Absolutely impossible. There could not be a greater difference between the Dark Lord Luke's father actually is and the good man Luke wishes him to be. It is impossible. You cannot bridge that gap. You cannot undo these differences. But remember, through the Force, all differences are illusory. Through the Force, everything is the same. And it's only when Luke truly internalizes that everything is the same, that he is the same as the man in the mask, and the man in the mask is the same as him, that Luke finds the truth that he needs to find, that if I can choose good, then he can choose good. And that's what happens, and Luke does achieve the impossible. If you're a longtime follower of my channel, you may have heard me say my take on the big overarching theme of Star Wars. I say this in like my fifth ever video, I think. The big overarching theme of Star Wars, as I see it, is that the biggest cosmic events are shaped by small moral decisions of individuals, which itself is a theme that sounds impossible. Cosmic events, decisions of individuals, how can the two possibly be connected? And yet what we see in this franchise, all three movies, is that what decides the fate of everything is not the might of the galactic empire, it's individuals choosing to stand up for justice. What true strength is is not the incomprehensible firepower of the biggest space station ever, or even the firepower and military plans of the rebellion. True strength is a selfish man making the decision to help out a friend. And of course, more powerful than all the political might and control, more powerful than all the magic, all the hate, more powerful than the most powerful dark lord in the galaxy is a simple instinct of a parent to protect their child. It is a real idea. It is profound that there are things happening in the world in the galaxy, in the universe, that seem impossibly bigger than we are. There's nothing that you could do or that I could possibly do, nothing that could ever effect a positive change in this grand scheme. But if you look to the example set by the Jedi, we see a completely different approach coming from a fundamentally deeper understanding of just how reality works. Listen to this clip of Squirkle's mom describing how this worked with Obi-Wan, how he understood and interacted with Luke. And it, particularly how Obi-Wan describes it to Luke, that it's it's um, that it comes from all living things, that it's a force that penetrates us and binds us and and wraps us all together um and and that idea of of um that connectivity among all living things i feel like that's something that luke was really starving for um mm -hmm. when he was living with his aunt and uncle um again kind of back to the comment that was made earlier that you know he doesn't feel heard he doesn't feel understood all of his friends are leaving he feels very stuck and um like he's not connected to the rest of the universe 
and and that is what Obi-Wan can really provide for him in in so many different ways. He is that father figure that he's been lacking. He is that connection to the rest of the universe that he has been craving and that that connection there is i think a really powerful one we described this as kindness earlier obi-wan isn't just being kind jedi philosophy and ethics doesn't care about being kind per se it's about understanding the supreme value of connection and harmony in the universe what obi-wan is doing is valuing the connection happening right now forget politics forget secret messages forget that there's an interstellar war going on this moment is about me connecting to this other valuable life in front of me all the important cosmic stuff can wait let's sit together and talk about you about your life about your father let me strengthen that connection for you. Let me help you connect with your sister. Let me help you connect with your friends. Let me help you connect with all the rest of life in the galaxy. I love this little moment in the conversation where you see on the most detailed level what this philosophy looks like in action. They watch the message and Obi-Wan says this. You must learn the ways of the Force if you are to come with me to Alderaan. So Luke hears Obi-Wan say this and he just says no. He refuses and Obi-Wan does push a bit, but to be honest, it's kind of weird. Luke doesn't have good reasons for saying no. He brings up a bunch of stuff he doesn't really believe in. Obi-Wan could very easily just convince him. He could explain to him how dire the situation is. He could prove to Luke that his reasons don't actually matter, but he doesn't. He stops pushing, he stops arguing. He doesn't fight the no, instead he says this. You must do what you feel is right, of course. So when Luke says no, Obi-Wan's response to that is granting Luke agency, which is something that has never happened with Luke before. No one has ever told Luke you must do what you think is right. Listen to how his uncle talks to him. I told you to forget it. Your only concern is to prepare those new droids for tomorrow. Obi-Wan knows that Luke wants to leave Tatooine. He knows that Luke wants to become a Jedi. So instead of essentially ordering Luke around like his uncle does, he connects Luke to himself. He makes him more harmonious as an individual. And he doesn't worry about whether Luke will come to the decision on his own. There is no difference between cosmic and personal. That difference is also illusory. Harmony is always what the situation needs. That is what will solve everything. That is the deeper layer of connection that the Jedi philosophy is all about. And now I can go back and address those maybes that I threw in the script earlier, because something else, another difference that is conveniently illusory, is the earlier distinction I made between audience side and story side. In this story, there is no difference. What we're saying now, this profound idea of connection and sameness, while that may sound very different from all the attainability stuff with Obi-Wan from earlier, it's actually not. Listen to Squirkle explain why why, this point was just brilliant, super subtle. You can even hear me struggling with it at first, not quite understanding it, but she's making such a strong point here. Listen. I feel like lots of uh, shonen style anime, mm -hmm. like you can tell that they're like, okay, uh, we need to show this character growing. We need to show his power growing yeah. in a very concrete way. Mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 what can we add here to make mm -hmm. it feel like progression where it's like, because of the power, they are growing emotionally and therefore a complete person. And here are the exact concrete ways that they grow in the power. Like, we'll tell you explicitly, like, this is exactly what they could do with this new power. And this is why it's different than what they could do before. And this is why it's, like, better and bigger. Whereas Jedi, like, once Luke becomes a Jedi like fully a Jedi, there's like not too much of a need to show power progression. You don't need concrete proof that he's more powerful because he doesn't need to give you that concrete proof. And the way that Obi-Wan didn't need to give you that concrete proof and that mm -hmm. Yoda didn't need to give you that concrete proof. You notice the emotional state of the person first. Yeah, okay. So the emphasis is not on the power, but on the emotional growth of the character. Why is that a more compelling way to do power progression because it, personally for me mm -hmm. um, i i know that the force isn't real and i know that i can't like the force pull a remote towards mm -hmm. me or whatever mm -hmm. but there is this lingering thought that if i can get to an, an emotional state where i feel settled in my life and content and willing to let things go but also willing to make connections and like like be able to have like massive emotional resilience and the ability to believe in people the way that luke does mm -hmm. that that in and of itself is a kind of power that i can obtain i see okay all right, that makes sense. So even if there is emotional progression for other power progressions, the power progression aspect of it is so loud that we don't feel like we ourselves are connecting to it because we don't have that power. But with the Force, then I can feel like a Jedi because of my emotional disposition. 
Um, yes. Even without, okay, got it. I think people look at the restraint of Jedi powers and just think it's all about upping that cool factor, that mystique. And usually with most story elements and most stories, that is mostly what restraint does. But with Star Wars, with Jedi, it's different. Restraint and this specific kind of restraint relates directly to what Jedi are. What Squirkle is describing is that if I admire, like, let's say, Goku, well, I'm just not a Super Saiyan. Nothing about me is Super Saiyan. I can't do the things he does. I can't look the way he does. I can't accomplish what he can accomplish. And these things, what I just named, that is what the idea of Super Saiyan equals in my mind. Those external things are my experience of what this kind of hero is. Because even if there is emotional progression, and there is, it's those external things the story has spent the most time and space conveying to me. In Star Wars, the vast majority of all time spent with Jedi is them not using their powers. We establish the fact of power through other means, usually through relationships with other characters, and by using hints. And then the time spent with them is mostly about strongly demonstrating an attitude, a philosophy, an ethic, or an emotional disposition. And when I personally, me, the audience or want to feel like a Jedi, that is what comes to mind. It's being in the zone, it's being in harmony with what's around me, it's trusting in the universe. And that is Obi-Wan's death scene. That moment epitomizes this idea. You can look at the iconic line that he says, you can look at the way it happens, and there's lots of interpretations of what that means, how to understand the idea itself. If you're interested, I'll throw out four different interpretations that I came up with, you can pause if you want, but it's almost not important because of the meta idea being communicated. If Jedi are all about this path of emotional and really spiritual development, what we're being shown here is the pinnacle of that development. This is where the Jedi path leads. Complete peace with the scariest thing in existence for most people. Death. And really complete security as well. The line he says to Vader is, you cannot win. Obi-Wan is describing a type of invincibility. So conquering death, becoming invincible, these are impossible things. A single plane or ship destroying the Death Star is an impossible thing. But what Star Wars aims to communicate is that the impossible can be achieved by relating to reality on a deeper level. If you change yourself, if you change the way you relate to reality, if you find that deeper layer, if you're willing to unlearn what you've learned, develop yourself spiritually and emotionally, transform your understanding of the world you live in until all differences melt away, until you've gotten rid of all these things that divide us from ourselves, like uncles and physicality and targeting computers, you will find true empowerment internally that way. It's not about the magical powers, it's not about the warrior stuff, the meaning of Obi-Wan's guidance, and just who he is as a person, from his kindness to his death and beyond, the meaning of Yoda's profound education that Luke fails to internalize in episode 5, but finally learns at the end of episode 6, is that there is a deeper way of relating to reality. And if you attune yourself to it, you'll not only find peace, you will be able to bring it into the world in bigger ways than you could ever dream. That profoundly inspiring idea is what makes Jedi so compelling. That is what Jedi used to be. Subscribe if you'd like to join in on these amazing big group analysis discussions that I do with my community where we build ideas like this with Star Wars and with Hasbro Hotel and other random media that I like, all sorts of things. You can join my Patreon if you wish. $2 gets you into the Discord where you can discuss all sorts of things to your heart's content with like-minded thinkers in my community and with me as well. At times, sometimes I'm very busy, can't always interact. And then $5 gets you that and also gets you into our monthly group analysis calls. And let me tell you, totally unbiased, they are always great. I personally have been like mind blown every single time by the ideas we build together. It is just just incredible. You guys are incredible, the whole Shani community, incredible. And on that note, huge shout outs to all of you. As all of you can see, so much of this particular analysis was just ideas from those discussions. Gigantic thanks to those whose ideas I use verbatim. Noam, Joe, and Squirkle all have YouTube channels, go check out their content. And thanks to Squirkle's mom as well, unfortunately she does not have a YouTube channel yet. Also, shout outs to new high tier patrons, Arrow and McHugh, Mr. Brightside, Evan Sanchez, Power, and Gurgly Agolder. Gigantic thanks to all of you. Anyway, more Star Wars content to come. Stay tuned, hope you all enjoyed, and may the Force be with you. Have you ever considered the fact that Yoda might be an apex predator? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Can you explain that to me? <laughs>